One minute. And we are on. Welcome to the lecture on bookbinding and cover art. <laughs> Just testing. Um, well, our topic is the silent manipulation of storytelling, or how to lie for fun and profit. I am your host in this endeavor. My name is Stephen L. Sears, and this is my somewhat pretentious banner. Um, if you uh, notice, most of my work is actually in television. Um, I did start in television about 38, 39 years ago on a show called Riptide. My second show was called uh, The A-Team. I was actually one of the original writers on that. Uh, but you can see I've done work, Stingray, Hardcastle McCormick, Highwayman, She Spies, uh, Swamp Thing, Raven, uh, was a co-exec producer and one of the head writers for Xena, Warrior Princess. Thank you. And uh, co-created uh, Sheena, the last incarnation we had of that. Uh, in my prose area, um, in the upper right there, that's a nonfiction book about working in television. And I have done short story anthologies for Jeff Sturgeon's Last Cities of Earth, um, Stalag X, which was a collaboration with uh, Kevin J. Anderson, which is in development right now for a feature. And uh, I submitted a story for the um, Alien vs. Predator anthology, which Jonathan Mayberry and Brian Thomas Schmidt um, were the editors. So that's just my way of saying I know some stuff. Um, what we're going to talk about today, however, is um, your connectivity to your readers. Because the more you can do that, the more you can connect to your readers, the better your sales are going to be. Obviously, the better your uh, readership, your popularity, all your hits on YouTube, um, they're going to increase. Um, but to do that, there's a lot of things we could talk about for marketing and areas like that. I want to go on a much more base level. And I think what we need to do is we have to understand the power that we have as storytellers. That's really where it begins. We have a very, very powerful gift. It is a manipulative gift. It is something that we use to create worlds out of nothing. We are storytellers. We find certain genres and certain venues, screenwriting, writing in prose, poetry, even humor, jokes. That's all a part of the storytelling. We do it for entertainment, but it's the same technique and the same process that have brought nations to war, created cults, and is the source of all propaganda. It's how we use that particular power. And this is not going to be as dry as you think, because I just said that. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about, um, and, and keeping in mind, we have about 45 minutes, so I've got to go through a lot of this quickly. I hope we can get to a Q&A. If we can't, I wander around out here. Just come up and ask any question you want. Um, this was my business card uh, a while back. <laughs> the reason I still have this is because I paid for like 1,500 of them, and darn it, I'm going to use it. Um, but you'll notice the alleged writer there, and everybody laughs at that. It's actually not a joke. I never intended to be a writer. This is totally accidental. When I went to Los Angeles, I was an actor, if you didn't figure that one out. And I got interested in how scripts worked. I would read them, I'd break them down, I was just curious. And without giving you the long story, suddenly uh, a friend of mine and I, we were writing together for the fun of it, ended up on a TV show. That was Riptide. And that started a 38-year career. And I'm still active today. But I put up alleged writer because the only reason I know I'm a writer is because they keep paying me for it. <laughs> so I had to look at that and I said, well, you know, really am I an alleged writer? Because I. I am a natural storyteller. I've been doing this since I was a kid. But back then, we had a different word for it. <laughs> but I took it to the next level. <laughs> and yes, that is me. 
Okay, so now where did this ability come from? Where did you get this ability? And that's what we're going to talk about this. Um, are we all storytellers? Is it a learned thing or an innate ability? Now, my belief is that it is a gift that you have. I cannot teach you to be creative. I might be able to help you release it, but I can't teach you. But where did this begin? Now, the origins of storytelling are actually rooted in the very survival of our species. I'm not kidding here. Dramatic music in your mind. Um, to understand this, you need to literally go back to our primal selves. Okay, so this is our little Australopithecus, and he's kind of walking along, minding his own business, and he sees a little movement is right, something small, it gets larger and larger, and ah, there it is, and he's eaten. Okay, <clears throat> now that ends the genetic line right there because the lion took him down. But wait a minute, this is another Australopithecus. This one is kind of walking along, hears a noise, looks to his right, he sees something large, it's charging at him, he reacts quickly, he begins running as fast as he can, and he still gets eaten. He's not that fast. End of that genetic line. However, this Australopithecus, the one that hopefully is our ancestor, he's walking along and he's casing out his surroundings. And what he does is he looks over and he sees the brush. And in this brush, he notices shadows. And three of them particular, in kind of a triangle shape that could be two eyes and a mouth. In his mind, his survival mechanism is kicking in. He's projecting the idea, the possibility, that there is a predator in there. And being a proto-storyteller and seeing this lion, he defends himself in the way that is the most effective for a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> Which, amazingly enough, works. <laughs> <laughs> now, abstract thinking is actually the essence of storytelling. Um, now, many animals have developed a certain trait, so I'm generalizing quite a bit to try to get through a lot of the stuff. But abstract storytelling, abstract thought, is when you take things that are part of your physical environment, then you try to connect them, not just so that you can imagine what they are at the moment, but you can project them into a possibility of the future. And this is kind of a really bad graph for it, but I kind of use the old idea of telling about the hunt. Now, this started when we became a communal creature when we started living with others. The hunt is a good example. So the hunt is an experiential thing. Afterwards, the tale of the hunt. Now, many times, back then, of course, without language, it was acted out around the fire. But it was relating a past event. But by doing that, they learned more about the hunt. More they learned, the more they could plan the next time. Now, what they're doing now is they are projecting this into the future. They're actually telling a story about something that has never happened. That abstract predict prediction is what leads directly to storytelling. It is a part of our language. But again, it is that, that one connection that says we can go from the reality of the moment to actually creating something that never existed and playing it out. In the, in the common sense, it's you're scripting it. You are actually coming up with something that doesn't exist. Now, uh, cave art, has shown this quite a bit. Um, you can see little bits of it, which is left behind. And this is the next step. Because not only did they think abstractly about events, they codified it into a form, recording images. Because now, they were not just projecting it into their immediate future. That was for their generations. Their stories now exist. And they keep following. And they keep following. Um, you can see in the closest art here, the little handprints, this is a part of themselves projecting themselves into the future. Now, um, of course, the follow-up to this, absolutely, is that once you get to this part, once you get to the actual artistic representation of a story, the next step in humanity is obvious, which is critics. <coughs> <laughs> now, um, <laughs> you have to believe that sometime when they were actually doing the artwork, there was a guy standing back there going, oh, oh, no, 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 no. So now, where does this bring us now? Okay, We've come a long way, and I've, I really have shorthanded a lot of this stuff in our evolution. We're much more complex. We have a lot more thoughtful um, ways of working out our stories. Our abstract reasoning is much more uh, complex. But this is where we are now. How can you take all of that and apply it not just to your storytelling, but to how you actually market things? Because the more you understand about how you do this, the more you understand how you connect with your readers. And the first thing you have to do is put the lens on yourself and say, how do I have this gift? 
why do I have this gift? So this is an obvious one that I hope everybody knows. What is writing? Okay. Writing is, basically writing is an association of words. It's an alphabet that connects together to form words, and the words are put together to communicate something. Storytelling is not that. Storytelling, the best possible storytelling, is when I have you face to face, and I just tell you a story because I'm connecting with you identically. I'm just like right there, I'm watching your emotions, I'm watching how you react to that. Taking it to the written word is something that is kind of taking for granted that I can project what I know about myself and how I can connect with you and hoping it'll go through the page. So a writer is just somebody who communicates, but a storyteller, that's who you are. That's something quite a bit different. So how do we get there? The first thing you have to do as a storyteller is we have to talk about breaking down your walls. Even though all of you here are authors, you have already succeeded in breaking down a lot of walls, but we're going to challenge you even more. Even more. This is why you're your own worst enemy, as I put it up here. And I'm going to do a little spiritual thing here. Uh, if you imagine that when little children are born, they come out of the universe. They have all the knowledge of the universe. All the knowledge is right there in their little heads. But they don't speak our language. They just kind of burble, gaggle. They've never spoken a language. They don't know. So what do we do? We teach them our language. The moment we start doing that, we're kind of putting little walls around what they can express because we're telling them how they can express. And what's the one word they hear the most often? <laughs> no. Now, it is originally meant to be protective. No, don't touch that. You'll burn yourself. No, don't throw the cat out the window. No. <laughs> but after a while, it becomes, no, you'll embarrass me. No, don't do that. No, don't be who you are. And with every no, a wall goes up. Another wall. Another wall. Another wall. And eventually, you are so encased in walls that you can't be creative anymore. You're told not to. Your biggest obstacle is to break down all of those walls. And I don't just mean get on top of them. I mean destroy them. That is the hardest thing for people to deal with. Everything that has made you comfortable you have to kick it aside. You have to start from scratch in those areas. You have to challenge yourself. There's an old saying that you need to do something that scares the heck out of you every day because then you'll know you're living. So your own worst enemy is you. Before you can get past those walls, nobody can get to past the walls to get to you, to connect to you. Your readers cannot do that. So. How many people have had this question? Where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your ideas? I'm just curious. Now, I don't know what your answers are, but I can tell you what my answer is, and I think most of you will identify with this. If somebody says, where do you get your ideas? I'm like, where do you not get them? I can't stop them. I can't shut them down. I can't walk. I mean, I've got seven stories just looking right now. I can't stop coming up with stories, but I don't stop myself from exploring them. Can I come up with an original idea? Maybe not, because so many ideas have been done. But I can come up with another way of telling that story. I can come up with my unique way of telling that story. I can break down those walls that tell me how I have to structure a story and say, but here's the way I want to tell it. And that all relies on this particular question. You've all asked yourself this. What if? What if? OK, I take this for granted. I'm walking down the street, and I see this going on. OK, I've accepted that. But what if? What if I turn that on its head? Once I turn it on its head, I'm now exploring the options. I can tell a story about this. I don't accept just what is in front of me. Um, I always use this uh, example about uh, I used to go down to the airport back when you could just sit at the airport. And I would watch people, and I'd make up stories. I would see two people talking, and I'd make up a story. And I was in there one time, and there were these two people having a discussion, and one of them was holding a donut. I don't know if it was the discussion was who bought the donut, but they were having a heated discussion. And they were like, da 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 with the donut, and back and forth. And so I'm sitting there, and I made up this whole scenario about how they knew each other, what their background was, who they were as people, made it all up. I had it. I had my story. It was perfect. But then I thought, now I'm going to tell it from the perspective of the donut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So these are the writing components you're familiar with. Format, three-act structure, your characters, your world, outline, writing, 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 so on. So let's take a look at those. Again, try to look at the psychology behind a lot of these. The three-act structure, we take that for granted. Even in complicated, complex novels, there's still a three-act structure, even with diverse threads. They have a basic three-act structure. A beginning, a setup, a conflict, a story, and then a resolution. Now, we are naturally attuned to that three-part structure. Jokes are three-part structures. Setup, setup, story, filling it in, everybody laughs at the joke. Um, you ever watched a reality show? And they're not? You know, how the, you know how you can tell they're not a reality show? Because if you give me 40 hours to follow you around with a camera, I can cut down that to 30 minutes and make you do anything I want. <laughs> but what I do is I realize, but my audience expects that three-act structure, so I craft that so that it has a setup, a conflict, and a resolution. Life is not like that. <laughs> Life is, you're born, set up, conflict, my life, and I'm dead. <laughs> so you get, like, canceled mid-series. <laughs> but that's how you can tell. If it's got a three-act structure, it's been crafted for you. Why? Because it appeals to us on an innate nature. It appeals to your readership on an innate nature. Is it in every story? Yeah, it is, pretty much. Is there an expectation of it? Yes. I don't know why. It's just there. We expect it. It happens to be there in all genres, even in puns somehow. Um, but let's go to this with a character. Okay, so another thing about characters, uh, or actually the first thing I'm going to talk about characters, not caricatures, connecting with your readers. When you get to characters, you've got to create characters that are absolutely believable. And when I say that, it means you have to create characters your readers can connect to. That's every character. If your character only occupies 130 words in your book, make that the best possible character you can. Make sure that all the characters are that believable. With a protagonist, keep in mind, protagonists are not always heroes. Protagonists are heroic. A hero is the person you want to come rescue you. Heroic is what you hope you can be. Every reader feels that way. They want to identify with that. If I was in that situation, I could rise to that. A villain. No villain's a villain. They have a legitimate reason. Give them some love. There is a reason why they do what they do. We don't like it. And in fact, we don't even like talking about it because we feel like if we do that, we're condoning their behavior. No, we're understanding it. And I will tell you something. If you do that, your villain will be horrific. Um, I've used this kind of a horrible analogy, but you'll get the point. There are two characters that are the hardest to write in Western literature. One is Jesus Christ, the ultimate goodness. The other is Adolf Hitler, ultimate evil. Now, the thing is, is I know Adolf Hitler was evil. I have read the history books. I've studied them. I know about all of that. But that's become part of our history. You say it, and I accept, okay, I know who you're talking about. You know what really terrifies me about him? He loved dogs. I love dogs. That I could have a reasonable conversation with Adolf Hitler, sharing our love for dogs, that terrifies me. Because that means that part of me can touch that evil. You create villains like that. You will connect with your readership, and you will scare them. And what happens when your villain is more formidable? What happens to your protagonist? The heroic struggle becomes greater. Um, emotional honesty. This is another thing about characters. If I were to pick one of you um, and say, who's your best friend? And you were to tell me. Um, and I would say, oh, tell me everything you know about this person. It's the person you know the best. You know so much about this person. I can guarantee you, you're only going to know 20% of that person. But that 20% relies on the 80% you don't know about. An entire lifetime. When you create your characters, keep that in mind. You, as the author, have to understand that 80% of that character. Now, you may never write about it, but it means your character is real. I had a marketing meeting at uh, one of the studios uh, about a character I created for a series. 
And they said, so tell us about this character. And about 45 minutes later, <laughs> they stopped me and they said, oh my god, you're the most prepared producer we've ever run into. And I said, yeah. And they go, how are you going to get that on the page? I'm, I'm not. But I have to know it because that makes the character real. And the final one, I think everybody knows this. Good, evil, servicing, doesn't matter. Every character is the hero of their own story. Treat them that way. Respect those characters. And by the way, as an addendum to this, if you can do all of this and create characters like that, the whole question about crossing genres with your work, you'll be able to do it. Because character is the key. That's what people identify with. Spaceships, ray guns, all that other stuff, those are trappings around it that your characters have to interact in. Again, this touches with your readership. And this all goes to basic psychology. You're using all of this to engage the reader. You are actually plucking the strings of social evolution. We are born with these things. You see it a lot in propaganda. I don't have to explain to you what racism is. But I can manipulate you because racism is what's called tribalism. Tribalism was a survival gene in our community and nature. It protected the community. If I saw somebody from walking out uh, toward my community, and my community has 30 people, I know all of them, it's a stranger, could be a threat. I'm suspicious. So the moment I notice something different, skin color, immediately, that's not a part of my community. Tribalism. Now, you don't even know that exists. But people pluck it every day. You can use that to engage the emotions of your reader. But the first thing you have to do, study yourself. You are just a subject to it. But study it. Study why it works. Read books by anthropologists, psychologists. Understand human nature. That's where the great greatest value in your writing is going to come out of. The other area is that once you have your character, once you have created them, you've got to put them in these worlds. Now, your world, this is all about world building, has to exist, your characters have to exist in a world that is real. Doesn't matter if it's fantasy, science fiction, future, past, contemporary, all of those. Each one takes an effort to establish. But more importantly, you can't just say, oh, they're in a future world where everybody has hovercrafts. You need to make sense out of it. You need to make it a part of the reality. The reader will actually fill in a lot of the blanks. You don't have to worry about being too detailed about it. And this is a quote here about world building. World building is the act of creating, defining, and exploring a fictional world in such a way as to make it accessible and relatable to others, including societal rules and structure, defining government and laws, or lack thereof, currency, levels of technologies, and other necessities that impact a character's day-to-day -day life. And that was written by Jessica Browder, and I'm proud to tell you Jessica Browner is my wife. <laughs> it's right over there. Um, we were discussing this one time, and she just popped off this definition. I'm like, oh my god, that's exactly what I'm trying to talk about. So this means you've got to complete a world that the audience becomes comfortable with and doesn't question. Okay? Again, all rules have to make sense. Even in you know, fantasy and magic universes, the same thing. Superman can't fly that fast. A friend of mine was at one of the uh, screenings of uh, Superman back when it was uh, Chris Reeves. And... Um, there was a, I think it was a second movie where this little boy falls off Niagara Falls. And Clark Kent sees him. He goes running over there. Da, 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 da. And people are looking over going, oh, no, oh, no. And then the shot of the kid, he's falling. And then suddenly Superman comes out. And he jumps. And he, shh, and he rescues the little boy. The guy in the next row goes, Superman can't fly that fast. You got that he could fly. <laughs> you actually applied a rule to it. That's actually good. There was a rule applied to that. I created a whole fantasy. I had a friend of mine. You remember the series Alf? You remember that? Oh, yeah, the little Muppet, you know, it was the alien that was caught in the family's home. I asked a friend of mine, well, I thought he'd love that. And I said, you should see this. It's a great series. And he saw it. And I said, what do you think? He goes, eh, I don't know. He goes, you know, the daughter in the house, she looks a little too old to be in high school. And I said, but you bought the Muppet. <laughs> So you've got to create that world that they can accept. Um, now, you know, one way you do this is don't overwhelm your audience. You don't need to be too intellectual. Intelligent people, they think we're going to be, you know, people will be fascinated with all the knowledge and all the details. I'm going to write a steampunk novel. Now I'm going to tell you how every piston works because it's so cool. I'm going to do breakaway diagrams because it's so cool. 
and the reader's going, eh, when do we get back to the character? Oh, there's the duck. You know, they don't care about those details. However, you don't have to explain it, but you have to justify it. Again, those details have to fit within your universe. You have to be consistent. You see what we're doing right now is we're taking everything emotional about your readers. We're pulling them to engage them in your story. So you're not just telling them a story. They're being pulled into it. This is all something that we are socially adept at doing. It's a part of our communal effort. Um, now the outline. Um, this is just actually kind of some technical stuff here. When I write an outline, I just kind of write out the high parts first, beginning, middle, and anything that pops up. I don't put too much stress on myself. I just kind of relax, kind of go with the flow. I let everything pop up. Um, I allow my mind to go to the obvious, but I don't stay there. I don't want it because that's the easiest path. And one of the things we do as little primates is we try to look for the simplest path, the easiest way to accomplish something. That's not challenging. The moment you say, I can do it this way, nobody will catch it, you just did. Stop. It doesn't mean you have to make it difficult, but challenge yourself on everything. Keep in mind the connective tissue between those major points. People don't think about this. It has to be just as compelling as the major points. That is the interactivity. And don't forget the what if. Always question what you're doing. Look at that and say, is there another perspective? Can I put it in there so that my reader looks at the page and goes, oh, yeah. Now, that's a George Carlin term. That moment where you, you're reading something and you hit it. And they go, oh, yeah. You want to have that in like every chapter at least. Now, everybody finds their story differently. That's pretty obvious. Mine is just a guide. You could have somebody up here telling you this story 180 degrees opposite of what I'm telling you, and they're right, and I'm right. We just have different ways of, of approaching this. So don't think that when you go into the next panel if somebody says something they disagree with me, don't raise your hand and say, well, but Steve here said da 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 No, no, no. Understand why they have a different way of approaching it. Don't drive yourself crazy, kind of like chill frog. I like the chill frog. Okay, so the hardest part of writing. Everybody know what this is? You all have an idea of what the hardest part of writing. And I'm going to tell you this. This is the hardest part of writing. Ready? There it is. <laughs> Get your fingers on the keyboard. Start writing. Most people talk the talk, but they don't even bother doing this. Most people are afraid to do it because they think perfection has to come out of their fingers. You guys know better. You know that your first draft is crap. Or not. You don't know. But you got to start writing. you got to let your mind free. you got to start just roaming across that keyboard. Get the fingers moving. And I will tell you, this is the hardest thing for me to do. But once I do it, <clears throat> I go into that zone. And you guys have all gone into that zone. When you're kind of sitting there and you're going like, da -da 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 -da. I don't know why I'm hungry. I'm kind of hungry. I've got a headache. I'll get something to eat, which I should have done 48 hours ago. <laughs> now, this is all coming together. You've engaged your readers. You've created these, these characters that are riveting. Everybody, it, it's like right there. You got that stupid grin on your face. You're in the zone. It's fantastic. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing it. It's absolutely, and all of a sudden, there it is. There it is. Now, you're going to be afflicted with some version of this. Writer's block. How do you deal with it? It's a log jam, but it's not something that you cannot deal with. I'll tell you the way that I deal with this, the way I absolutely deal with my writer's block, is I basically let my characters handle it. If I receive, if I get some sort of a blockage right there, I don't know where to go, I have literally, literally, because we're talking about authors, I have literally had my characters talk about the author that he's blocked. And how, what are we going to do? How do we help him? I don't know. And they talk about their circumstance. And you know what happens? They actually solve the problem for me. Then, of course, I delete all of that talk because they're talking behind my back. <laughs> and now I write the story. Sometimes, however, you need to just get to the other door. Walking into a room, that's your chapter. Oh my gosh, I'm blocked and I have to go there. I got to get him onto the pier. How do I do that? Sometimes just type. Walk him across the room. Whatever has to be said is totally functional. Get them out to the other side. I kind of look at it this way. It's, it's kind of like if you are um, looking at a cornfield. Corn's really high. And you know you got to get to the other side. You just don't know how to get there. So you got your machete and you're chopping through and you're chopping through and you're chopping through and you're chopping through. You're making choices. You're turning this way or that way. You get to the other side and there's a helicopter. Cool. Get in the helicopter. You fly up. Then you look down and you go, oh, yeah. 
Okay, so if I'd done this, I'd done that, done this, I'd done that. Sometimes you just get to the other side. The problems will solve themselves. But don't obsess over it. Many times it's your muse just saying, go take a break. Go out and play. Let your mind rest for a moment. And, you know, chill frog, basically. <laughs> okay, very quickly, how will I know my story is perfect? It won't be. Sorry, it will never be. It will never be until it's published, and even then, if you ever read it again, it will never be. I never look at the stuff that I've written or produced. I really don't. I try not to because I'll sit there and go, I should have done this, I should have done that. I know all the choices I could have made. And you are going to get input and critique on your art. That's going to happen. You have to accept that. You have to be happy with the fact that your story is not perfect. But if you can cash the check, it's perfect enough. <laughs> but your appreciation is basically a formula. A equals Z divided by K, where K is proportionate to M. A is the adjusted net appreciation of your art. Z is the number of people art is shown to. K is the diplomacy and kindness in the reaction. And M is, I only showed it to my mommy. <laughs> okay, so if you write for yourself, you have 100% appreciation on your art. If you write for friends, you are now diluting that appreciation of perfection. Understand that and accept it. If you write professionally, you now have a worldwide readership, and they are going to critique you. Do not assume they're wrong. Listen to what the critiques are. That can make you a better writer. But don't take it personally. Because the bottom line is if you have a worldwide readership that is criticizing you, guess what you have? A worldwide readership. <laughs> You're doing pretty good. So at the end of the day, you just have to write what you believe in. For novelists, this is my own personal belief, don't chase after the readership. Let the readership find you because your heart and your passion is what makes you unique. It makes your stories unique. That's what will attract people. Going back to the primal self, it attracts the community around you. The marketing problem that you have to deal with, which is beyond the scope of this panel, is how do you make them aware of your work? But the first priority is this. Somebody asked me one time, how, you know, how do you become a successful screenwriter? And I said, well, I, I don't know, but I can tell you this. <laughs> Going back to that zone I was talking about, when you have that moment, you're sitting there typing, and you're looking at the screen, it's like, oh, God, this is great, great. And you're in the zone, you're spotting that stupid grin again. Characters are in your head, all the voices, da 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 And then you look over your shoulder, and you notice the rest of the world is watching you. Now, I can't tell you how to get them to do that, but I can guarantee you this. You'd never get there if you were looking this way. Always believe in yourself and what you are putting forward. Never catch yourself saying, well, this isn't good enough. Then you make it good enough. Philosophy, to keep you sane. For most of you, too late. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, what is your goal? As your, as your profession, as your endeavor, as your approach, what is your goal? You are thinking of something right now. It's not that. And it's not the other one you just thought of. It's one thing. You want to be happy. That's where your best writing comes from. You want to be satisfied. You want to be happy. Now, what can make you miserable is trying to figure out how to do that. But I'm telling you, if you follow your heart, if you follow your passions, and allow yourselves to become that little child that never heard the word no, you will accomplish that. <sighs> so we go back here to our little Australopithecus, who has done his best, and has evolved into us. And now we are these creative creatures, and we've connected to each other through storytelling. That's what holds the fabric of our civilization together. And that's what creates the civilization for the next generation and the next generation. We retrain as we move forward. And hopefully we always move forward when we use storytelling in the positive sense and not in the polluting sense. And I kind of look back at that and I say, that's where it started. And it started with just a little bit of lion <laughs> right there. <laughs> so there we go. That is my presentation. Um, thank you. Good. So we got a few minutes here. Do I have any questions? How did you manage to work for so long, considering? Any questions? Okay, cool. Um, I will be wandering around. Oh, you, oh, there you are, standing up there. Good. Okay. 
I thought you were leaving on me. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to go to the microphone, right? There you go. You got it. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to a writer who has outliner's block? Um, <laughs> In this case, I can outline the whole book, and then I get to the and then I say, these characters don't have any interesting motivation. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and... I'm depressed, and why get out of bed? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how many people have gone through that? Yeah. Okay, that's not an uncommon thing, and it, it's absolutely a great question. Uh, in screenwriting, we used to refer to it as the 40-page block, because at 40 pages, you stop, you lean back in your chair, and you're going, where am I going? What was my point? My characters are horrible. I don't believe where I'm... What it basically means is that what charged you to start your story is normalizing itself. You're so excited to tell this story, and, but you've got to tell it. It takes a while for that to come out. And at a certain point, you get exhausted. And so the cure for that kind of goes back to the writer's block thing. Take a break. If you have to, move things around in your story. Challenge yourself. One of the techniques I used to use is I would sit there for 15 minutes studying my outline or what I had of the, mo of, of the outline at that moment. And I would not allow anything to interrupt me. I would literally just study it, but I wasn't trying to fix problems. I was just studying it. If something interrupted me in that 15 minutes, I actually started the clock again. When I was done with that 15 minutes, my fingers go on the keyboard, I've got a blank page. Whatever pops into my head, I type down as bullet points. And I mean whatever. <sighs> Dog just walked into the room really hot in this room. What if Jerry has a dog? Jerry has a dog. Jerry lives in the Caribbean? No, that doesn't work. No, no, because we already have him in Arizona. Jerry, you see what I'm doing is I'm allowing my mind to then make the connective tissue on its own. By putting myself in that world for 15 minutes, I've immersed my mind in that. And your mind tries to connect the dots. That is another thing about abstract thinking. When you are presented with certain things in front of you, you try to connect the dots. It's, again, a survival gene. So if you are concentrating on something for a certain amount of time, it's kind of like staring at you know, this weird image on this thing, and you look at a piece of paper, and oh, it's Abraham Lincoln's face. Your mind is trying to connect those dots. So give yourself the freedom to do it. Now, not everything you type is going to end up in your outline, but all you need are two or three nuggets to charge you once again and to get excited. I have also come up with characters doing that that did not exist in my original incarnation. And I went, oh my god, i got to put this character in, which is another thing. Don't be afraid to do that. Oh my gosh, i got to go back to page one and start rewriting the whole thing. If it's the correct move, do it. It's not a task. It's enjoyable. It's what, you, what, what makes you live in these characters. Suddenly it becomes exciting again. Another question? We have an online question, actually. Uh, online question. Uh, this is from Kenna Shaw Reed. She asks or says, Imposter syndrome, uh, when a review or a negative author slash reader interaction makes you question your ability to construct a single sentence, how to maintain a belief in yourself? Very good question about the imposter phenomena. Um, if you're not familiar with the imposter phenomena, it's basically that any moment now they're going to realize you're a total fraud. <laughs> you are successful, but it can't be because of me. I'm not that good. I'm really not that good. I can tell you at least one person that I know intimately who has had that for their entire career. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. My wife will tell you. I am blessed by having the success that I've had, and I don't get it. And part of that is because I was having so much fun. I was loving this, so obviously it can't be real. Eventually I'll figure out what I want to do. But until then, I'm having fun. Now, imposter phenomena takes it to the next level. The extreme part of that is that no matter how good you do, you're going to be listening to the negative voice and not listening to the positive voices. And even worse, the loudest negative voice is right in here. You have to assess yourself, and you have to go back to the core of what you're doing and why you're doing it. If none of you could make a living at this, I would say probably 80% of you would still do it. Now, when you do make a living at it, yo, great. 
But I will tell you, as somebody who has done this and has made you know, pretty good money at it, never, ever let the money own you. The moment it does, you are not being yourself. You're serving a different master. Never let that happen. As a side thing and playing dad for a moment, never get yourself in debt that you can't get out of. Because the moment you do that, you're only writing for the money. And you will be miserable doing it. And odds are, you realize, I can't make enough money to do this. Now I got to go work somewhere else. And all of you have had to do that at one point of your life. Follow your aspirations and work at the same time. So why would you compound that by saying, I'm not worth this? Then why are you putting the effort into it? Because you love it. Go back to that. So the imposter phenomena is real. And almost every creative person will go through it to a certain extent. <coughs> More questions? OK. Oh, wait, we got one here. Sorry. Just um, when I think I'm going to get you out for lunch. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So for those of us who work multiple jobs or a full-time job, have kids, and write part-time, is there a good balance that you can suggest? Uh, <laughs> other than get up at 3 in the morning. Yeah, I know. You know, and I tell you, if you're raising a family, oh my gosh, I, I, I worship you. It's, it is, I, one of my best friends um, working in television was raising a family, and I don't know how he did it during all of this, and television is brutal. Um, in my opinion, family always comes first. Um, I have told many people in the, uh, the film and television industry, no matter what they do, what their aspirations are, when they get up in the morning and they head out the door to go to their office, stop, turn around, look back, and remember what this is for. It's always about that. Now, that is your priority. Past that, I have this saying that I say people make space for the things they want in their lives. You have to figure out what that space is. But it cannot come in the way of your obligations to your family and to your health. I do not subscribe to the alcoholic writer. I do not subscribe to living in misery just to get your art done. I don't subscribe to that. I don't think it's necessary to do that. And too many people mistake it. I have to struggle for my art. You will struggle. You don't have to struggle. That's your choice. I can tell you right now that working in television, as I did for, you know, have done for 38 years, it is the most debilitating, it is the most frustrating, it is the most angrying, it is the most incomprehensible thing that I could have chosen. And it's by far the most rewarding thing I could have ever had. It's just fantastic to live out my dream. Is that worth it to you? You make that choice. But life, as you pointed out, has realities you have to deal with. But always leave space for yourself. Always do that. Don't overwhelm yourselves. Find that little playground that you can run into and go play. And don't put pressure on it. Don't ever listen to anybody who says you can't do it. And definitely don't ever listen to anybody who says, well, if you don't do it this way, your career is over. Because if they say that, guess what? You got a career. <laughs> You're already there. So find it in yourself. But again, I understand the priorities. And you've got to figure out exactly where those lay in your life. Anything else? Cool. All right. We've we got eight seconds left. Thank you very much.